Hello and welcome to our topic one of chapter 16. Today we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court. All right, you can see here on the screen, this is a picture of the United States Supreme Court building, which is located in our nation's capital, um, only about a block away from the U.S. Capitol building. Um, the Supreme Court did not have a permanent home through most of the early history of the United States and only was given a permanent home um, as late as 1935. All right, let's start off talking a little bit about the Supreme Court and its schedule. Um, it, it's on a schedule that's very similar to the schedule of Congress, very similar to the schedule of a school schedule. Um, the court is basically in session about nine months out of the year. They take breaks for uh, the spring, they take uh, a winter recess, and they will also take a summer recess. Generally, their session is going to start in October, and it's going to run until June or July. The case in the court is very busy. Um, more than 10,000 cases are actually appealed to the Supreme Court each year. Um, that number has gradually grown um, as the United States has grown in size and we've become more litigious. Um, if you look at 1945, about 1,400 cases. 1960, about 2,300 cases. Um, and in the last 50 years, that caseload has um, grown by more than five times to more than 10,000. The, the issue here is the fact that the court only hears about 75 to 80 cases, and the cases that it hears are the cases that it wants to hear, that it chooses to hear. So it is very selective, and your chances when appealing to the Supreme Court of them actually hearing or reviewing your case are very low. All right, so the court actually sits in session um, for two weeks out of each month, and it alternates. So if it's in session the first two weeks of October, it'll be... Um, in session again um, the last um, two weeks. So again, it alternates back and forth, two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, and again, that'll change a little bit with federal holidays or recesses. They're gonna hear cases Monday through Wednesday. Um, generally, they're gonna hear two cases each day. They start at 10. These um, cases are open to the public, and you can actually go and sit in on a case. I've had the, um, the great privilege of sitting in a bunch of cases in the Supreme Court. Um, it's a pretty cool experience, um, and I would highly recommend if you do ever have the opportunity to go ahead and check it out. There is no recording, video recording, in the Supreme Court. You can listen to um, the actual proceedings, um, audio recordings, but there is no video. All right? um, they'll do two cases each day, beginning at 10. Um, on Wednesdays and Fridays, Wednesdays after Wednesday afternoon after their cases are finished, and then on Fridays, justices will meet in a private conference with just the justices present, and they will discuss the cases that they've heard. As they discuss those cases, they will sometimes take a vote on majority, minority, which way the court is leaning, and they will also, in, during those conferences, decide who's going to write those opinions, the decisions of the court. We'll get to that here in one second. Justices will spend those other two weeks, the two weeks off, in between each two-week work session um, preparing for cases, writing other opinions, reviewing materials for upcoming cases. So it's not like they're working for two weeks and they take two weeks off. Okay, They are very busy. How does a case make it to the court? Um, the cases make it to the court two ways. Um, one is called a writ of certiorari or called a writ of cert. These are cases where um, you have a legal error or some kind of constitutional question or issue um, in the ruling of a lower court. So it could be a, a rule, ruling generally of a federal appellate or federal district court, um, and the Supreme Court is going to reach down and grab this particular case. They reach down and grab that case in order to make a clarification of that case or a ruling in terms of the Constitution um, and how it should be applied in the United States. Okay, this is a writ of cert is we're going to issue or they're going to reach down, they're going to grab that case. Um, cases can also make it to the Supreme Court on appeal, on straight appeal. Lower federal courts or high, highest state courts, um, their rulings can be appealed due to a constitutional question. So the Supreme Court can reach down and grab your case, or your case can make it to the Supreme Court through the appeals process. So how do they pick cases? Well, the justices and their clerks, each justice generally has a handful of law clerks, um, individuals right out of law school who work for them. Um, they're going to handle a bunch of their research. Um, they're going to help them you know, work on opinions and write briefs. They do all of the, a lot of the grunt work. And again, as the court has grown, this need has grown also to help the justices out. So they're going to create what's called a discuss list, a list of issues that the, that the court, or in particular that justice, would like to see more of 
So justices are going to review those cases they're interested in. They will discuss those. More than two-thirds of the cases that make it to the Supreme Court are not really ever discussed by the justices. Um, <clears throat> four of nine of the justices have to agree to hear a particular case. So it shows you that a minority in the court can get together and say, hey, let's hear this particular case. This is called the rule of four. So four justices have to go along with um, the idea that that case is going to be heard. All right, when we're talking about handling cases in the Supreme Court, there are four basic steps, okay? First, you have the briefing. If, if your case is going to be heard by the Supreme Court, um, your attorneys, your lawyer, your legal team is going to put together a briefing. That briefing is going to include everything that is relevant to your particular case. It's going to have summaries, different points of view. It might include amicus curiae briefs from interest groups writing, you know, why this decision is the right decision to make. It lays out different legal precedent. It also has a record of all of the steps of the case um, before it reaches the Supreme Court. Huge documents. The second step after these briefings are submitted or the, is the actual oral argument. Um, each lawyer presents. Each case gets one hour. Each side gets exactly 30 minutes to present their case. And it isn't like a trial. It's a presentation of evidence. All right. So the timer begins. The lawyer, who is, whoever is going first, has 30 minutes to discuss their case or talk to the court about their case. The nine justices are active. They can ask questions. They can interact with the lawyers. Um, they can ask the attorneys to clarify certain things, to talk about different pieces of legal speak, evidence, whatever might come up in the case, but it is a conversation. It's as much a conversation between the lawyer and the particular justice asking the question as much as it's a discussion between the justices. A lot of the time the justices will kind of flesh out or get a feeling for the other members of the court in terms of how they feel or view a particular issue through the questions that they ask the attorney. All right, so it's a pretty interesting interplay between the justices and the attorney, and it can be very entertaining. All right. Um, once that's over, and again, the chief justice is responsible for making sure that the lawyer at the 30-minute mark, he finishes, the other side goes. They don't get more time than that. That's it. All right. Once the case is over, then it moves on to the conference. A few times a week, the justices get together, and they meet in secret conference together. They sit down, discuss the cases, and again, they will sometimes take a vote. Once that vote is in place and the court has decided a majority and a minority or a unanimous, whatever the decision of the court might be, the justices are then given um, assignments in terms of who's writing the majority and minority opinions of the court, Okay, the winning and the losing side of the decision. The chief justice, one of his jobs as chief justice is to assign who writes the majority and minority opinions for each decision. Okay. Once these are complete, and again, if you have five justices writing on a majority opinion, those five justices will craft an opinion together. Okay, they will attempt to craft an opinion together. Um, and again, they all have to agree if they're going to sign on to that majority opinion. Justices also have the option of writing what are called concurring opinions, which basically they agree with the majority, but maybe for a different reason, or they want to make a particular statement about their view of the law and the interpretation of the law. When all of these briefs are completed for each case, they are then released to the public, and that becomes the record or the final decision of the court. Four different types of opinion. We have a unanimous opinion where all the justices agree. We have a majority opinion where a majority of justices, it could be five, six, seven, eight justices agreeing. Uh, we have a concurring opinion where a member of the majority agrees with the decision of the court, maybe for a different reason, different reasons, or they would really just want their interpretation on the, in the public record. And then finally, we have the dissenting or the minority opinion. That's where the losing side um, could be four, three, two, or even one justice is not going along with the idea or the majority of the court, and they discuss why they disagree. All right, so those are the different types of opinion. All of the decisions of the Supreme Court are put in writing, and they are made public. All right. A little bit of additional information here about the makeup of the court. There are nine justices, a chief justice, and eight associates. Congress will set or can set the number of justices on the Supreme Court. It's varied anywhere between five and ten throughout our history. The magic number of nine has been that way since going all the way back to 1869. The average age of a justice on the court is a little older than a member of the House or average age in the Senate. It's about 66 years old. And their salaries, again, similar. Uh, Chief Justice makes a little over 200000 and the Associate Justice right behind at 194. In private practice, these justices, who are lawyers, would generally make a lot more money. Again, it's a job in terms of prestige, not so much as pay. 
limits. Supreme Court justices are limited in the idea that they can be impeached by Congress. Um, this has happened only one time with a Supreme Court justice, um, and it was an impeachment. Um, the accusation of wrongdoing, um, the justice was not convicted by the Senate. Um, it's the same exact same process of the president, impeachment in the House, a trial in the Senate, or a Senate conviction and then removal. This has happened in some of the lower federal courts. Duties, they hear and rule on cases that are brought to the court. There really is no full explanation of the job as a Supreme Court justice um, in the Constitution. Who are they? More than 100 men have served on the court, only four women, and those four women have basically served only beginning in 1980 with Sandra Day O'Connor, followed by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, Sandra Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. Um, usually they've had legal experience going all the way back throughout the history of the Supreme Court. Not always true, but in the modern era, these are um, lawyers um, and judges at lower federal courts before they get the call to the Supreme Court. Again, as I mentioned before, they are older. Um, most of them are added to the court in their 50s. John Roberts, who's the current Chief Justice, was 50 when he was actually added as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. If you look at them in their backgrounds, they are going to come from upper class upbringings, different from um, middle class upbringing of the President um, and Congress. And the justices are appointed by the President. This is one of his powers of appointment, but they need to be approved by the Senate. All right, and that's a simple majority vote today. Thanks for joining me for topic one of chapter 16. We talked about the Supreme Court. Make sure to do the Google form. Thanks.